So, on track now, it's the historic Trans Am cars. Now, this is without doubt the highlight of the weekend for Tony Ferrella and the SVRA gathered group here, certainly for Tony anyway, because this has been a special gathering, if you will. We are celebrating 54 years of Trans Am, and this is where it all began in 1966, right here at Sebring. Now, the cars we've got on track right now are, well, they're late 60s, early 70s, and we've got a combination of many of the great vintage classic here from Trans Am, and a man who's been watching them very closely for the last three days, including one race yesterday, is Scott Conway. And Scott, um, well, first and foremost, as they get out on track, I know you're going to introduce them, but I'd like to know what happened yesterday, but take it away of what we've got out here. Okay, we got uh, Bill Ockerlin, who has come out in that Plymouth Cuda, the 42 of Ockerlin, and he won yesterday. It looks like this uh, grid, uh, Jonathan, is uh, pretty much the way they finished in the race yesterday. And Ockerlin in the 42, that uh, Plymouth Cuda, it was uh, driven by Dan Gurney originally. Jim Haig will be alongside him in the 16A, that's the Ford Boss 302 Mustang. Richard Goldsmith in the 77 Dodge Challenger, that was uh, originally driven by Sam Posey. Jeff O'Neill will be in the 16A Ford Boss 302 Mustang. Jeff O'Neill will be in the first of the Chevrolet Camaros in the 15A. Then John Fudge in the 71, Fudge also in a Chevrolet Camaro. Jerry Underwood will be in the 33 in a 1967 Shelby Mustang. This is the only remaining of the 1967 Shelby factory Mustangs that ran back in the day. Dennis Singleton in the 92. Singleton in the uh, Pontiac Firebird, that is the only Pontiac Firebird entered, as uh, Pontiac was kind of late to the game here in the factory wars that uh, were the 66 through 72 years that these cars represent. The Ken Adams in 45, Adams in a Ford Boss 302. We have uh, Terry Bruckheimer in the 1A, that is a Ford Mustang. Also in a Ford Mustang, the 11 of Ross Myers. And a Dodge Dart, yes, I said a Dodge Dart. Gary Underwood in the 18 as Dodge. This was the lone factory Dodge Dart in the 1967 season, and it is represented here. And again, folks, these are the original Trans Am cars. These are not replicas. 67 of Jerry Clark. Clark in a Chevrolet Camaro. Tom Forgione in a Ford Mustang in the 28. And then we have uh, Tom Cotter in the 98 rounding out the field in a Mercury Cougar. And these uh, cars, Jonathan, you were asking me, they represent 1966 through 1972. That is the historic Trans Am series. It's run out of California. Uh, Bill Auckland is in Holland, Michigan, but the majority of these drivers are coming from California, and that will be where the second race of the series will be held as part of the uh, Trans Am Speed Fest with SVRA, May 1st through the 3rd at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. You will not want to miss that. They'll have even more cars there. Some that couldn't make the long tour from California will be there. It amazes me, as you say, these aren't replicas, but these are so well prepared. I was having a look at the cars yesterday. Um, it, it's almost, I mean, you close your eyes and, uh, and sort of glint a little bit. It, you're back there. You're back into the late 60s and 70s. Uh, it's as though these cars were never touched, but they were raced hard, beaten up, paneled out, and all the rest of it. But uh, here they are again in immaculate form. This bumpy circuit, though, how tough is it on these cars? Well, the last time they were here, which was 2016, it was a lot bumpier than they, they expected. They had a great field, of, uh, 35 cars came, but they had such a hard time because, again, as you point out, these cars back in the day could not do a whole lot with spring shock settings, et cetera, that you can do with modern day Trans Am cars. And they broke a lot of transmissions. They broke a lot of drivetrains, and you just don't go down to your local Dodge dealer and get another one. So a lot of the teams prepared this year, they brought extra ones. Uh, Bill Auckland telling me that just about every team had an extra spare transmission, and some teams were loaning parts to others just to make up that. So uh, they came prepared, but to answer your question, yes, it's rough on these. We're about to find out how good they are in full kilt now because they're coming round Sunset Bend. The safety car has jumped in, and Bill Auckland will lead them round. Yeah, we have a green flag. Away we go, great start. And Jim Haig and Bill Auckland have been the two quickest drivers all weekend long. In fact, Auckland winning the first race yesterday in the historic Trans Am reunion. Jim Haig had sat on pole, but was unable to take home the win. Haig and the boss, uh, Ford Boss 302 Mustang, the 16A. Bill Auckland falling to second at the uh, start. Then Richard Goldsmith in the 77, that is a Dodge Challenger who uh, resides in third. Nice clean start as they go into turn two, and you can see the field spreading out as we go on the drone. Pretty cluttered at the back, and um, 
I would, I, w I would hazard a guess that these guys don't want to damage these beautiful cars, but they're racing them hard. One car slowing down there, sadly, and uh, I'm not sure if there's a mechanical, but he's getting passed by several cars. But at the front, we've got a drag race down to seven. Yeah, an interesting story about the 77, who uh, was in third at the drop of the green flag in the, uh, the first factory entry for Dodge was at uh, Laguna Seca, and they were last in line for Tech. And they were passing tech. They were very nervous about this. They passed. They were all overjoyed. They went over and, and uh, offered the tech inspector a beverage. And the tech inspector rested his elbow on the roof. And the roof dimpled, almost caved in. He said, wait a minute, we can't have this. What had happened was, there was uh, they used to acid, body, acid dip the bodies to reduce weight. Well, they did the roof a bit too much. So they called uh, Dodge. Within an hour of this happening, they went down to uh, the local Dodge dealership torched the roof off of a Dodge uh, Challenger that was in the showroom, took it back, put it on, and they uh, went on to resume the season with uh, Posey finishing fourth in the championship season. Acid dip. That sounds a little scary. How thin did they make the metal if he's pushing his hand through it? Well, it wasn't supposed to be that easy to do. Uh, the, the roof was left in just a little bit longer than the rest <laughs> of the body, and nobody realized it. Nobody would have realized it, except that he happened just to rest his elbow on there, and the, he said, they say dimpled, uh, on the press release, Auckland said it almost caved in. Dumb luck, I guess, but uh, yeah, well, that's motor racing. Everybody tries to get those rules as close to the cl close to the mire as they possibly can. Talking to close, as they come down the back straight, we've got a cracking race on here between Jim Haig and Bill Auckland as they come down into view now towards Sunset Bend. Nothing between them at the front. They are pulling away from the third place man, but not by much, and the field's starting to spread out. Now we've got a great right three-way battle as they go into Sunset. And this, again, harking back to the 66 through 72 factory wars. We have a uh, Ford Boss 302 Mustang in first, a Plymouth Cuda in second, Dodge Challenger in third, then another Ford Boss 302 in fourth, and a Shelby Mustang in fifth. Ken Adams is the man we were looking at in uh, fourth, uh, sorry, in fifth place in the number 45 a moment ago, coming through Sunset as the leaders come through turn one. Nothing between the top two, absolutely nothing, as they head down towards turn two just getting onto the dust for a moment there but uh, everybody cleanly through good start to the race as we look from above yeah you said nothing was between them only seven one hundredths of a second separating Haig and Auckland and you were asking me about yesterday's race we had I believe it was a 10 lap race yesterday and we had six different lead changes uh, the top five drivers all of those drivers at one point or another during the race were in the lead and Bill Auckland just happened to be in the lead as the checkered flag came out Auckland, that uh, was the reason that he was starting on pole for today's race. So when you talk about parts, how do they fit parts? Now, do they have to kind of mold their own ones and come from the modern day and, and, and put parts on? What are the rules in terms of what they can actually put on the cars to make them go if they haven't got what they need? Well, one of the things that Historic Trans Am is very proud of is that these cars are in original condition. They are exactly the way that they were run at the time of their particular um, production and they also have to run the exact liveries of the first year of that production. In other words, if it's a 70, 71, 72, whatever Camaro, you have to run the livery of the 1970, the first year. Uh, all the parts, some are made, but the majority of them are actually available. Uh, you know, the, the, the vintage market, here we are at SVRA with over 200 and something entries this weekend, fabulous. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different manufacturers that are actually making vintage parts, not new parts, but they're actually vintage parts that actually fit into these older cars. Uh, these muscle cars you know, are very, very uh, valuable. If you've seen any of the latest auctions, which uh, you should race, uh, watch between racing seasons over the winter, you'll know just how valuable they are. So that these cars are priceless. You, you wreck one of these and you cannot replace it. And that's why I think, why I admire some of the, oh, talking of uh, wrecking almost there, the number 98 getting come around, that's Tom Cotter. 13th at the time and just spun it round. He puts his hand in the air to say he's A-OK, -okay, but uh, big moment there. But luckily, he hits no walls, and luckily here, Sebring can be forgiving at times in some of the wider corners. But now, talking of forgiven, here we got another leader, the Dodge coming through. Into the lead goes the 77, nicely done by Richard Goldsmith. Yeah, Goldsmith was one of the top five that we were talking about yesterday. Again, we had uh, four different lead changes, or six different lead changes amongst four different drivers. And we'll watch to get a confirmation. It is Richard Goldsmith in the Dodge Challenger over Bill Arkland in the 42, the Plymouth Cuda. And Ken Adams now has uh, made a good drive up into third in his Ford Boss 302, the 45, getting by Jim Haig in the 16A. 
the Top Cotter Mercury Cougar, that is one of the uh, three Budmore Factory Cougars that were in the um, 67 championship, I believe, when they finished second to AMC uh, Javelin by two points. And Scott, you can't overemphasize how important this particular era and just this group of years was to American racing. You know, we've all just seen, or a lot of uh, fans will have just seen the Ford versus Ferrari movie, uh, which went back to the 66 Le Mans. But that's when, you know, things started really going here in the American market. And as you say, the, the war between the marks was very much in operation in this era. And so it was such a huge part of American motor racing. Yeah, the original uh, term, whatever you uh, went on Sunday and sell on Monday Correct. Came from this Trans Am series. And you're right, this is a, a huge, uh, exclamation point to the Trans Am that we currently know that we had watched earlier in the day uh, 1966 as you mentioned the first race was held for the Trans Am here at Sebring International and Bob Tullius who went on later to win a Trans Am championship won the first over two liter in a Dodge Dart that's not the same Dodge Dart that's out there now but he did win and uh, we also have uh, John Bishop who had the foresight to copyright the name and uh, a lot of people will say well Pontiac Carver Trans Am must be Trans Am was here first, and then the Pontiac Firebird Trans Am was made after that took that name. I'm glad you cleared that up, because I've been asked that a few times about, oh, when you say Trans Am, people go, oh, the car, and you go, no, the series. And a lot of people then get into that argument. Yeah, Pontiac was very late into the manufacturer wars. They did not enjoy a lot of success. They had uh, two cars, both of them, well, actually one of them, I believe, driven by Jerry Titus. The only championship they won was in uh, 85, and that was with Elliott Forbes Robinson driving. But in the 66 to 72 era, they were not very successful, no, certainly not as successful as uh, Ford or um, Lincoln Mercury or AMC Javelin or Dodge or any of those particular makes. And within those years, 66 through 72, it was very evenly split. Uh, Ford won three manufacturer championships. AMC Javelin, I believe, won two. And it was, uh, I believe, Ford was also with two. And as we see them fighting the wheel, uh, and uh, again, this is something I really admire about these cars, is like you said, you can't just throw a bunch of modern brake calipers and uh, you've, got to, you've got to stick to what you had. So these drivers also, you can't just put a, an Ernie Francis in there and, and, and expect them to go as well as they normally do in their normal car. This is tough racing. I was talking to Ernie in the last race and he said he'd love to have a go, but it was pretty intimidating because he knows he wouldn't have all the, the modern gizmos to help him. I don't know. I think you put Ernie in a soapbox yeah. derby and he would win. Uh, <laughs> That's he, a good he point. He's a, a phenomenal driver and has certainly shown that, showed it here earlier today in the, uh, the Trans Am race. And he, you know, if you watch the modern day Trans Am cars, and Ernie Francis Jr. is a good reference point, you see them uh, on those inboard and onboard shots sawing at the wheel because they don't have any driver assist. Well, these were even worse. Sure. A lot of these cars uh, actually came from dealer showrooms. In fact, there are several cars out here that one of them, and I believe it's Jim Higgs, although I'm not positive, was actually purchased through what was then the GM employee purchase plan. And so you purchased the car kind of on a financing type thing. Another of these, and I believe this was the Mercury Cougar uh, that the owner uh, that uh, has the car, uh, the original owner, uh, he went in and convinced the, uh, the dealership manager that they should build the Trans Am Cougar. And for some unfathomable reason, he said yes, and the rest is history. That's great. I love the story. I'm keeping an eye on the times. Jim Hay just did his fastest lap, 235.9, and that's why he's retaking the lead momentarily, although we've got a good battle at the front. Terry Underwood also doing a really good job on the 33 in the lone Shelby Mustang, and uh, that's a 67, and he's pedaling hard, no question about it. Adam's just doing a 237.4 last time out. Yeah, when Ford originally uh, came into the historic uh, to the Trans Am series, their Ford Mustang, of course, was the car that they used, and they went to the Boss 302. Well, they had a Shelby Mustang, and they had a factory team. I believe it was a three-car factory team, and this is the lone remaining that we know of factory Shelby Mustang that was part of that team and is out here uh, running around in Sebring in anger, the 33 of Terry Underwood driving. Well, you're going to say, you just mentioned that they're priceless. That is probably, I mean, it should be in a museum, and I'm glad we in this sport do not consider museums to be something that you just go and visit. We actually watch them race hard, and I love it. And uh, two of the cars that are not out here, they're in uh, Bill Auckland's paddock, uh, is the uh, iconic number six, that is the Mark Donahue, AMC Javelin that he is taking to Amelia Island for the concourse next weekend. 
He also owns the uh, even more iconic, at least to me, the number six Sunoco Camaro that is usually most identified with Donahue. Donahue drove the Camaro and he drove uh, the AMC Javelin. What a lot of people don't know is a lot of these cars that are out there, Donahue either at one time or another drove or Roger Penske had something to do with building. It's kind of like the Jim Ganassi of his day. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, you keep hearing Roger's name with all identify with all of these and uh, he's still I think he's still looking to go back and uh, maybe win in Australia as well again because he's already doing the business over there is Roger and so he's never really stopped has he I know we look at him now as indie fame but he's never really stopped doing this kind of racing you know I, I, I look at Jim Ganassi and uh, I recognize that he has been around a long time uh, it was funny when uh, I was doing uh, my calling around for the Trans Am series getting ready for Sebring I spoke to Chris Dyson and uh, his father, Rob Dyson, a uh, recipient of the, uh, the Bob Aiken Award, the RRDC Award, which was very sentimental to him. But I remember Dyson back when he ran in club racing. And uh, I said that to uh, Chris, and he started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that Dyson family is a dynasty, quite literally, and Chris carries it on. Sadly, not a good day for Chris today at the office, uh, his car conking out on him. But uh, as you say, part of a family in rich history of sports car racing here in the USA. So this race is kind of mirroring yesterday. We have Jim Haig back in the lead, the 16A, the Ford Boss 302 Mustang, Ockerland in the Plymouth Cuda in second, Ken Adams in his uh, Ford Boss 302 in third, and then Richard Goldsmith, the Dodge Challenger in fourth, and John Fudge in the 71, the Chevrolet Camaro. We hadn't talked much about the Camaro, but the Camaro was a uh, dominating force in the hands of Donahue, it, 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 definitely. And it was also a, a, a really well respected and a very good body style for Trans Am. Of the drivers that you have talked to, what do they say? I mean, those that have driven both uh, Camaros and the Fords, in terms of handling, how different were they as cars to handle? I mean, the original ones that we're looking at now. You mean the modern day cars? No, no, I'm just talking about these back in the day. Oh, back in the day. Uh, actually, they're, they're similar in the fact that they're very difficult to drive huh. uh, from mo a modern standpoint. From a historic standpoint, that was the benchmark. I mean, this you're looking at the technology that was top of the line sure. back in 1966 through 72. And yes, there were some um, technological advances, but most of these are just basically uh, showroom floor cars that had everything ripped out of them that could possibly be. We talked about the acid dipping process. You, you made it as light as you could. You hoped that the car stayed on the ground. Uh, there were more across the arms if you ever watched any historic Trans Am videos that you will ever see. And there are a lot here because, um, as you were calling the Trans Am race, and uh, uh, turn 17 is extremely bumpy, but that's where you need to be for the apex. Turn one, extremely bumpy, but that's where you need to be. Uh, turn, um, I believe it's the, wear, the um, hairpin down there, it has a huge bump on the inside just where you would like to be. None of those bumps in these cars get along together very well at all. Yeah, and like you say, it's as light as you can make it, but then there's bigger power as you can give it and bigger engine. They just kept going bigger and bigger and bigger and therefore faster and faster in a straight line. But then you've got to get around the corners, folks, and that's not easy when you've combined the two. A lightweight car with a big heavy engine in it and then turning it round, not an easy thing to do. And speaking of uh, trying to handle through the corners, these tires are all... These uh, tires... You're probably wondering, are they racing on their original tires? Well, no, actually, they recognize that even though you have different models and different years within this historic Trans Am series, they wanted to have a spec tire so it could be readily available and it could kind of even out the playing field as much as possible. So they're running on a, a Goodyear spec tire, and that way it kind of evens out the playing field for uh, all of the field. Talking of tires, somebody's gone into them, and uh, that looks like he's just... Uh I think, I think it was a mechanical issue. It didn't look like a crash in any way because by the time he'd come to a full stop, so I'm trying to work out which car it was that's gone off. We'll look at the timing and, and check, but one car off. But I don't think he's going to affect the race, to be honest, because the way he pulled off uh, was quite measured. So therefore, it looks as though he's parked it uh, out of the way or out of harm's way. And when we find out where he is, hopefully we can carry on this race because one car out, but we're not quite sure which one it is yet because we just saw the back end of it. It was one of the purple cars. Uh, Jonathan, while we were talking, we have a new leader. That's Ken Adams in the 45, the Ford Boss 302 Ford Mustang, uh, has taken over the lead. Bill Ockerlin in the Plymouth Cuda second. Jim Haig in the 16A, the Boss 302 Ford Mustang third. And Richard Goldsmith in the 77 Dodge Challenger in fourth. 
another story, and Sam Posey uh, told us this when Ed interviewed him, uh, I believe it was at Road America, was that if, and this was, was across any of the factories, but it just happened to be we were talking to Sam Posey, he said, if the car ever quit, they would interview you, you were not allowed under penalty of death to mention that it was a mechanical problem because these cars were being raced in order to sell them on the showroom floor. So if you mentioned that, they were very upset with you. That's interesting, yes. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to get away. How do you do that in a live interview? What do you say? Well, Sam Posey, you know, he used to be a commentator, so he was very <laughs> <He's> savvy. <laughs> but uh, some of them were rather descriptive, uh, expletive descriptive, <laughs> and, and some of them were, you know, they never really said yes, it was a mechanical problem because if it was, you would find that your budget was cut or you find that you might not even have a program at all the next day. Great stuff. We've got a six-way battle now, seven of the nine gone, and even though there's a good gap between first and seventh place, it's really close between the top seven. And Ockerlund now back into the lead, but uh, it's changed several times. Adams led, Haig's led, Ockerlund's led. And here we go. Here's the back of that group. That's the 33. And um, that's uh, Terry Underwood in that Shelby Mustang we talked about. And again, you know, we uh, had the TA2 powered by AM Infinity uh, just finished a few short uh, races ago. And we have Manufacturer Wars in there. Manufacturer Wars were the basis of the Trans Am series. And these cars, this is a short sprint race, but the first race that was ever run was here at Sebring. That was four and a half hours long, called the Governor's Cup. And in 1967, uh, the closest Trans Am race in history was decided by three feet. Now, why do I say three feet? Well, that was because that was before the advent of computer systems. It was before transponders. After four hours of racing, three feet decided the, the the race win. And that would have been, I reckon in modern terms, probably about two tenths of a second. <laughs> Something along those lines, yes. Also, uh, speaking about the uh, historic Trans Am series, the only time that uh, the Sebring 12-hour and Daytona 24-hour were included as part of the series was in 1967. And uh, these cars did actually very well against the, uh, the factory cars that came over from Europe. Why? Because the American Iron loves the big open track. And they actually were outlasting some of the European cars, uh, one of these cars finishing fourth overall. Pretty impressive. So here we go, down to the last complex here at Sunset Bend, and it's still the number 42. Adam's still in the hunt, and it's going to be close as they head down towards the last lap. Penultimate lap now. And it's anybody's race between the top three at least now. They spread out a little bit now. This gap of uh, the three cars at the front just pulling away at the front. Adam's still in the back of this group. With Auckland and Goldsmith. Yeah, four tenths of a second, uh, Jonathan, just uh, separating the top three. Auckland back in the lead, Goldsmith in second, Hagen third. Go ahead and pick it up, John. Yeah, I was going to say, when we get down to this stage, it really is hell-bent for leather. We had a seven-way battle, but I think we're now getting down to a three-way battle because they're t the top three pulling away as they come under the bridge. A chance to overtake now, perhaps now, but we're running out of chances. But uh, these guys, these top three, have been on it all race long. Really exciting stuff. The HTA, or Historic Trans Am, diving into turn seven. And now the fourth place, number 45, of Ken Adams rejoins the battle. Just think of these. These are priceless cars. Look at how hard they are racing. It's clean racing, but look at how hard they are racing. And that is a hallmark of this series. Yes, they are historic cars. Yes, they are priceless. But they're out here to race, not just to parade around. Yeah, the car we saw spin round was eighth place um, Tom Fortioni in the Ford Mustang Boss 302, a 1970 car, and he just spun out slightly, and uh, we just got a quick glimpse of him just a moment ago. Uh, but he's back out on track as we go back to the leaders and the 77 of Richard Goldsmith. And that is different from what crossed the line because it was Auckland and the Kunda who led across the line, so that uh, change has already happened with Goldsmith in the 77, the Dodge Challenger, Auckland trying to make it two wins in a row yesterday and today. John? Yeah, this is going to be really good because uh, right now we're swapping every other corner for the lead and uh, everything is going to come down to this final lap here at Sebring just as we wanted it. And I think if the guys from 66 
were watching this race, they'd be just as impressed to see that Trans Am is alive and kicking in 2020. It may be a new era and a new decade, but Trans Am is still as strong as it ever was, both modern and historic. Here we go, look at this. Down to the last corner, almost side by side, but the Plymouth just ahead. And if Auckland can hold on, it'll be a clean sweep of the weekend for Auckland, who won yesterday in the Plymouth Cuda. Richard Goldsmith, the Dodge Challenger, trying his best. I don't think he's going to make it, though, John. No, I don't think so. Here we go. On to the last lap, then. There goes the last lap board. And really, it's a case of where. Now, the next obvious place is potentially into here. And has he got him? Yes. So good drive. And uh, now, if he's going to come back, it's going to have to be turn two. But into the lead goes the car number 16. Did you see how sideways that Cuda was? Yeah, completely. <laughs> That's... Uh, a lot of steering input from the driver, the bumps, and a good driving skill all combined right there to keep that car on track. I'm trying to work out where he's come from, though, because he wasn't really in the group earlier on, but uh, he's done well. Yeah, Auckland was in the lead as he crossed the start-finish line in the Cuda. Haig in the Ford Boss 302 Mustang second, and Richard Goldsmith in the Dodge Challenger in third. And that is, again, those uh, factory wars. We have a... Plymouth Cuda, a Ford Mustang, a Dodge Challenger, and a Chevrolet Camaro up high in the ranks as well. Yeah, it's a good mix of marks, isn't it? Really nice. Just like back in the day. Yep. <laughs> and it just shows you how equally they are measured uh, in terms of uh, the car preparation and in terms of the driver skill too. Nobody dominating this race. Four-way race all the way to the end, if not five-way, as we come down to the closing stages of this. And uh, Scott, who's your money on? I put you, put, put you on the spot. <laughs> Well, I, I used to own a Dodge Challenger, so I'm going to go with Richard Goldsmith in the 77. Good call. <laughs> Here we come then, down to the closing stages. We're on the final lap then of this historic Trans Am race as we celebrate SVRA and modern Trans Am this afternoon. Two great races for the 2020 series in both TA and TA2. Ernie Francis Jr. taking the win. And Mike Skeen doing a really good job in his race too. But a four-way battle, if not five-way, right to the very get-go and right to the checkered flag as we look a little further down the field. Plenty of battles going on throughout. Yeah, Jonathan, the leader as they cross the line, Auckland averaging a speed of 86 miles per hour. That is quite impressive yeah. for a car from 1966, even through 1972, around this 3.74-mile uh, circuit. Yeah, and it's not overlooked. Here they are, spreading out again, down the back straight. It's a three-way battle. Here comes the Plymouth. One last try. Is he going to do it? You put your money on him. I think he's going to come good for you. But they spread right out as they head down towards Sunset. Yep, it's going to be a battle of outbreaking and see who can get the power on first. There's going to be a lot of sideways and crossed up uh, arms here as they come onto the front straightaway where it'll be the Plymouth Cuda, the Ford Boss 302, or the Dodge Challenger. Checkered flag is out. John? Oh, it's hard to call. Here they come towards the checkered flag and just by literally, I would say, three feet. <laughs> it seems like I just heard that. Yeah. Bill Ockelin leading and winning in the 42 makes a clean sweep of the weekend in that Plymouth Cuda, the 42. Jim Haig in the Boss 302 Mustang second, and Richard Goldsmith in the 77, the Dodge Challenger in third, just like back in the day, even in the modern times. Three different makes in the top three positions. Doesn't get any better than that, and here you are regaling us with stories of three feet finishes, and then we just have one. Absolutely fantastic. What a great show, guys, and uh, you know, it's hard with these, harder, with these older cars to sometimes get real good racing. But these guys weren't holding back. Like you said, the average speed over 86 miles an hour. That is not holding back in any way for a 66 car, a car that is in, well, you know, uh, <laughs> over 50 years of age. Uh, really impressive. Yes, and again, this is not the end of this series. They will be heading to WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca May 1st through 3rd. And then they will be part of the Detroit Grand Prix uh, in the Motor City. Where better, John, to have the, these muscle cars than in the Motor City. They also will be returning to the West Coast after Detroit Grand Prix. They will be part of the Sonoma NASCAR weekend. And they wind up uh, part of the, um, I believe it's the Rolex reunion race that they have scheduled. So five car series. If you're in any of these cities, uh, whether it be uh, Monterey, California for Laguna Seca or Belle Isle for Detroit, uh, Sonoma for the, uh, the NASCAR, or uh, for the Rolex reunion. Please come out and visit them. Uh, John, as you've seen, these cars are very well prepared. The drivers drive them very hard, very clean, and it's just nice, as with the SVRA, to see history out on the course where it should be raced. Yeah, and raced hard too, and, and, and look, as we see some of the uh, 
Other cars now finishing. They're racing just as hard too, but a really good strong field of HTA or historic Trans Am as we know it. Across the line comes the number 11. Uh, but Bill Ockland, what a good job in the uh, javelin. Fantastic stuff. 71. And I, I don't know if the other Trans Am competitors will say or not, but you know, I was telling you at the beginning, Ockland out of Holland, Michigan is kind of over the series. So maybe some people are talking to him saying, look, you know, just because you run the series, you don't have to win. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I got to say, how does he talk that down, you know? Uh, well, maybe he could have gotten away with it if he just won once, but he won both yesterday and today. So this may be a little difficult between now and Laguna Seca. Hey, it's his toys. <laughs> well, Jonathan, I very much enjoyed uh, spending the day here with you with the Stuart Trans Am, and we're going to be uh, turning it back over to Ed Conway as we have one last SBRA race to go that will wrap up this very well uh, uh, attended and glorious weather here for the Sebring Spring Classic here at SBRA, Trans Am, and Historic Trans Am. International GT also. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, and just to check on the scores then, Bill Ockland then with the win. Jim Haig in second place in the Ford Boss. And as you say, Plymouth Ford and Dodge Challenger, just as it should be as the script was written. Richard Goldsmith in third place, but each of them, including Ken Adams in fourth, took the lead for some time during that race. He finishes fourth in the Ford Boss 302. George, John Fudge, Jeff O'Neill in sixth place, Terry Underwood, Tim for Gianni, uh, getting a spin but still finishing eighth ahead of Jim Gla James Glass in ninth and Dennis Singleton in tenth place in the Pontiac Firebird. Great race, great display. Ross Myers, Cotter, Clark, Buchheimer and Gary Underwood in the Dodge Dart. That's right, finishing in 15th place. My thanks to Scott Conway and Ed Conway. We'll uh, take it up again for our final SVR races. What a great weekend and we'll all go and back, relax by the pool after this next one. How cool is this, pulling in the actual Trans Am cars from back in the day? Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Right over here. So for the viewers, what's really cool about this is this car says Swede Savage. Swede Savage drove this car in the Trans Am series. Bill Ockerland is the steward of it, but the, to race in this series, they have to be the actual car. So here we've got Peter Gregg, Sam Posey, the legends of Trans Am, and they're celebrating the 1970 season, which was the season of the most manufacturers. So you had Plymouth, you had Dodge, you had Ford, you had Chevy, you had AMX. Who am I leaving out? but it's unbelievable. So here, we're gonna go to Bill Ockerland right now. Bill, I'm gonna put you on the spot. We are live. You just won a race by what I would consider a transponder race. I think you won by maybe a foot. Okay. You and Jim seem to always Vince put on good loud. shows. I Tell me about winning at Sebring. The oh, it's just great. Uh, we love coming here with SVRA. It's one of the most fun events we do all year, and uh, we're happy to be back. We were here in 2016, and once again now in, in 20. So it's a lot of, Tremendous history at this track, and it's well, just really fun to race weekend, it. It's a fun track, and we, we enjoy it. So we're, we've come a long ways from California with uh, most of the cars, and it's it worth it, though. It's, it's a lot of fun. I love it. Yeah, yeah. You, as a Trans Am fan, you really store. don't get to, any uh, better than this. Really Trans Am look at that. Jim Haig is just in there, on, uh, just having Apple, a bottle of water. No big deal. Didn't have a tough race or anything. Tell me about your race out there with Bill. It was fantastic. I, uh, Bill was a little better on straightaways. I get him in the corners and trying to get him on the outside there in the last lap on turn 17 and the foot short. Yeah, but you, more than anybody else, it always seems like you're driving the car to break it. How in the world do you keep this thing together? Because you are all over the curbs out there. Um, the car takes it. It's bulletproof. Uh, Ken Epsman puts me in the best equipment ever, and this is a, a just flawless car. Just everything about it. It's just spectacular. Nice. And Love it. Thanks, Jim. you got to get out there because we're going to put you guys on the podium. Richard Goldsmith in the slime green Sam Posey Dodge Challenger, and he's actually out here racing with his son, 
Richard, tell us about racing out there. Well, I tell you what, that's an awesome track, awesome event. Uh, the guys I run with are gentlemen, but they're racers. Ken Adams, <laughs> I, I don't know how I held him off. He put in a heck of a run. Uh, we had a great time out there. Clean, nobody got hurt. Love it. Great event. Thank you. Nice. And I love it. We're going to call you guys up, up, up to the podium. Ken Adams, nice job. What I love about that is, I don't know if you were watching the end, but I feel like we could have thrown a blanket over these three cars. They came in so close. We're going to come up here to the podium, so if, when I call you guys up, what we're going to do is we're going to do the top three in historic Trans Am, my favorite group. Sorry to, if I offend anybody. You guys are welcome to come in and take pictures. Anybody out here? Hey, Ken Adams, don't go too far because we're calling up all the drivers up here. So, barely coming in third place in the beautiful slime green Dodge Challenger Sam Posey car driven by Richard Goldsmith. Is Richard Goldsmith, come on up here. Come on, you guys. We need to hear it for these guys. This is hard work out here. Sebring International Raceway coming in. Come on, people. And then coming in first place, was it a, que a clean sweep? Auckland, did you win both races? Uh, I guess so. no. Yeah, nice job. In the Swede Savage, Plymouth Hot Wheels Cuda, Bill Ockerlin, ladies and gentlemen. Come on now. Goldsmith, you came around 17 with Haig and Ockerlin. You did everything you could. Ken Adams was right there. Tell us about your race. Well, like you said, we were right there, and they are just that much faster. It was a great day. Great day. Track conditions were perfect. i got to ask you guys, and I want all of you to answer this. When you're out there driving these things around at Sebring, do you think I am driving the sweet Savage car? I'm driving the Sam Posey or Peter Gregg car. Does that ever hit you, or are you just like, no, nah, I'm just driving any old car? It always does for me. I, just, I really appreciate the car and appreciate uh, where it's been and uh, who drove it, and it's a spectacular car, and it is a piece of art. So try to keep it in one piece, <laughs> and we have, so it's a fun, fun day. Well, I've had the honor of going out there with the, the crowds, and we've had big crowds this weekend, and the question I keep hearing, are those the actual cars? And then the next question is, why in the world are they racing those things? Can you answer that, Bill? Sure, they are the actual cars uh, that raced in Trans Am from 1966 to 1972. Those are the only cars that we allow in our group. These are the, the actual cars that raced. And I've collected cars and had them sit in my garage and look at them and wait for the batteries to go dead. And I want to drive them. So this is way more fun having these cars and driving them and using them. And it's uh, just fun to have everybody be able to see them, too, because they definitely are a fan favorite. Uh, have them stuffed away in a museum just wouldn't work. Nice. Well, we as fans can all say that we totally appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Let's give it up for the HTA podium guys. Richard Goldsmith and the Sam Posey car. Tony, you want to come on up here? I need your help. Richard Goldsmith, third place. Jim Haig, second place. Bill Ockerlin, first place. But you guys were all at within at least a quarter of a second of each other. Nice job. You guys can open them, but it might be a crazy flight home. They all came out from the West Coast. Yeah, he said he already ruined one driver's suit. Nice job. And then if anybody else in HTA will come up here, that includes you, Tom McIntyre. You got to come up here, too. Anybody in the HTA family, we got to do a family photo up here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that will do it for the live stream of the historic Trans Am race, the most popular race group in vintage racing we're going to bring these guys up thank you so much for tuning in what a great race hey guys